Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I'm Tony Gerdeman, here as always with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Well, Tony, the spring football season and the spring game is over, so I assume there's no news and nothing to talk about. Is that right? We're just going to just be sort of rambling about, uh, you know, whatever topics sort of float into our mind for the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Is that is that what's happening? Is that what's going on? It would be nice if that was, in fact, the case, but it is not. There is obviously news, and, and we could start with the the biggest news uh, from uh, Saturday night, early Sunday morning, Brian Hartline uh, in an accident at his house on his property gets taken to the uh, the hospital. I believe was released Monday. Then, and uh, you know, Ohio State sent out a a statement about you know about the accident, a little bit about it, and you know, he ex- expecting to be released shortly from the hospital. No word on extent of the injuries, but. You know, obviously something pretty serious to have nine one one involved. Uh, but all uh, everything we're hearing seems to think that he will make a full recovery. And as as I think Ohio State said, these are non life threatening injuries. And of course, he's home. So th- there you go. But the 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 elephant in the room, if you will, is the fact that uh, I believe the nine one one call stated that the Harline had been drinking during the day or at some point. The um, the cops at the the hospital saying that the, the room smelled of alcohol. So then this brings into a, a discussion of um, you know not a great decision by Brian Hartline to be doing this and then putting somebody else in danger. I, I have this. Pro- I have a problem. Not a problem, but you, when um, people are drinking and driving, or whatever. Um, or just going out and drinking, because I remember even as a young guy, in high school even, uh, parents would be like, just stay home. You know, if, if, if you're all going to go drinking, just stay at one spot, don't go anywhere. And, you know, like the whole stay home thing. And, and here you've got a guy who did stay home and then, you know, still has this happen to them. So on, on one hand, you want to give somebody credit for, hey, thanks for not putting the public at, at large in danger, but also you still put yourself in danger and somebody else in danger. Not a great decision. Not a great decision. As you said, not the worst decision you could make, but not a great decision. And, you know, the the, the risky part of operating a motor vehicle while you've been drinking is not, you know, part of it is there's lots of other cars out there, but part of it is your reaction time is slowed and you're not able to operate it as effectively. And, you know, ATVs or four wheelers, whatever, are not the single safest vehicle on planet Earth to begin with under the best of circumstances. So I think this is, you know, I mean, you saw the immediate calls from, you know, Michigan fans that, oh, you should be fired immediately. And how could you not, you know, and it's like, I'm sure this has nothing to do with the fact that he is a rising star in the coaching field and, you know, an elite recruiter at his position group and on his side of the ball and all that, I'm sure. Uh, you know, that that you wouldn't be rationalizing things away if it was your, you know, if this was Sharon Moore or someone who had been in the same situation, because, you know, you've seen, you've seen lots of stuff get rationalized away um, at that program over the years and even last year, for example. So, you know, I think, I think, you know, this is, this is not a fireable offense by any means, but I think this is maybe, you hope this is a little bit of a wake up call where it's like, just work on decision making, maybe like that, that's just, don't put yourself in a bad spot. He is, as I said, a rising star in the coaching profession. He's someone who has gone from GA to position coach to now coordinator. And, you know, if he wants a head coaching job in the next two to three years, he almost certainly could get one at a pretty desirable program. You know, he feels like he's at least on the Jeff Halfley trajectory at the very least where, you know, you want to go coach. I'm just going to throw one out. Wake Forest. You want to go coach North Carolina State. You could probably get the North Carolina State or a North Carolina State type job. Pitt, maybe. You could get the Pitt job if Pat Narduzzi gets fired at some point. Don't screw it up. Like, you got to, all you have to do is not screw it up. You are very talented. You are very knowledgeable. You are very hardworking. All you have to do is make good decisions and not screw it up. And, so I think, you know, you hope that's a, um, you know, that sometimes you just have to get a little scare and, and that 
get you, you know, kind of does the old uh, unplug it for 30 seconds and plug it back in trick and do the kind of hard reboot. And uh, that that's enough to kind of to solve the issue. And, you know, you, you certainly hope that that's the case here because, you know, again, like one bad decision, you might not hurt or kill anyone else, but you can hurt or kill yourself. And, you know, not only are you a rising star in the coaching profession, you're also a husband and a father, and you've got little kids who want to have their dad around. So make better decisions. Yeah. And uh, even just sticking to the professional aspect of it, this is a leader of men. Uh, You're supposed to be the example for your players. And this is certainly not the example you'd want to be setting. Of course, you don't expect this to happen. And, you know, everybody's going to blow off a little bit of steam. I think after spring camp, you know, the majority of people are, you know, finally, we're out of camp, you know, but still, you have to be aware uh, and accountable for what could happen and and something bad did happen. Now, now you've got to, I guess, you obviously take ownership of it and maybe apply it to the to your coaching and to your room and to your players, I do expect some form of punishment. I don't expect um, that we would notice anything of it, except maybe and then when we do the FOIA on the salaries next year, and it's like you see somebody's been you know docked you know a couple of paychecks or something like that. I don't expect any suspensions and something like this. Um, you know, like what if a player had done it? You you, you go into the whole thing again and and again. For, first, let's see if anybody is charged with anything. You know, that's that's always going to be what you uh, stand behind. It's like, well, my hands are tied. I've got to see what the legal system does. And if there's nothing done, then, you know, no harm, uh, no foul, potentially. But if, you know, if if, if a player had done this and there, there's something, because we've seen, we've seen, a, go back to Doug Worthington, way back in the past, had a, had a DUI in the offseason, didn't miss any time. It's like when you do it during the season is when uh, the, the coaches' kinds of hands are tied, and then they have to to punish you. I, I I feel like whatever disciplinary action, if anything happens, I don't know that we'll know about it unless Ohio State releases a statement. Yeah, and you know maybe it's a an off season suspension. You know, you could you could suspend him for a week in <laughs> July, and I don't know that anyone would notice other than you get you know you get docked a week's pay or whatever it is, and. I, I don't anticipate it's going to be something more significant than that. I think it's probably, you know, with a lot of these things, um, I've mentioned this before on the show, I work my day job, I work in the field of addiction recovery. And generally in the field of addiction recovery, I'm not saying Brian Hartline's an alcoholic. I have absolutely no idea either way, but just generally more broadly speaking in the field of addiction recovery, when you get a DUI, a lot of times there's or when there's a pattern of DUIs, there is the trend in the judicial system right now is towards treatment and not punishment because you're trying to solve the problem. You're not just trying to, you know, exact vengeance on the person for making a bad decision. So, you know, maybe, maybe this is a, okay, like, do you need to get help? Do you need, you know, what kind of, you know, how can we help you change your decision-making patterns or whatever it is? So, you know, that feels like that's maybe more the general trend societally right now. And so, you know, if uh, if there are not charges or if there are charges and they get pled down, that would not be at all unusual in a case like this. No, and and honestly, that's pretty much what I expect to happen because it's it's normal. And uh, even in Ohio, it they don't always charge stuff like this when it happens on your own property. Uh, So we'll see what happens. Obviously, we'll continue to talk about it as more happens. But Tom, let's let's turn to. Um, I don't even know how to segue to this. Um, let's turn to other people who are affiliated with the Ohio State football program in some way. Speaking of transitions, yes. So uh, Ohio State uh, offensive line commit Ian Moore out of the state, the great state of Indiana. Uh, took, I don't know, offense to a, a Hayes Fawcett tweet. Uh, Hayes Fawcett from On3 makes all of the graphics and uh, for commitments and uh, is, is like always one of the first people to announce commitments because he's obviously working on the graphics aspect of it. But he, he tweeted out that 
Hayes Fawcett tweeted out, as of now, Michigan and Ohio State hold arguably the best offensive line classes with four commitments each. Which O-line group are you taking? And he lists Ohio State's four, and he lists Michigan's four. And Ian Moore, uh, Tom, if you want to take it from here, uh, Ian Moore uh, had, took some umbrage with the idea of how, how, comparing these two classes. Yes, Ian Moore logged on, which is always a great thing to do. Uh, <laughs> the exact tweet, come on now, hate to start beef, but two of those dudes are salty that they didn't get OSU offers, and the other two that just didn't get them. I've been to camps with everyone on that list except Mark. Mark's a dog, though, and the Blake kid. And I can tell you the Bucks are on top. And, you know, I mean, that's that's one of these things. This is one of these things, Tony, which, believe it or not, uh, people have different views on depending on which side of the rivalry they're on. You know, you have all the Michigan people saying, you haven't won in two years, you've gotten whooped in the trenches, you got to, yeah, you know, Sharon Moore, two-year Joe Moore Award winner, yada, yada, yada. And uh, the Ohio State fans, uh, quote, tweeting that, all talking about this class having that dog in them and all of that. And so, uh, believe it or not, Tony, when you uh, flip this uh and you know you have for example a kyle kalis situation where a kyle kalis is sharing his thoughts on the michigan side of the field uh michigan fans felt that kyle kalis may have had that dog in them or whatever the kids were saying back then and ohio state fans were pointing to recent success in the rivalry and the fact that you know hey you can't beat us so you know what why are you talking this is the you know hey this is the time of year when you succeed because you don't succeed in november it's it's All the same stuff. Tony, it's almost like there's a broader societal trend here, but we don't need to talk about that. That's okay. Uh, You know, it, it, this is one of these things where you're going to, your views on this are going to depend on your views on uh, a whole bunch of other stuff. And that was, that is going to be perhaps the best predictor of this. And, you know, as I have said in the past with, you know, Michigan players talking uh, in previous years when they had not won in close to a decade, you, you got to back it up on the field because if you back it up on the field, this is like J.J. McCarthy last year, J.J. McCarthy, McCarthy talking all that trash and, you know, taunting Ohio State fans before the, before the game. It's like you win and then, you know, you're then it's swagger. If you can't back it up and you lose, well, then you're a clown. So, you know, I guess we'll find out in a couple of years whether this was a good idea or a bad idea and, you know, whether whether this class does, in fact, Tony, have that dog in them. I, I saw this earlier in the morning, or like maybe in, um, what Wednesday night, I think, and I posted on the posted it on the board and was like, you know, your possible new favorite Ohio State Buckeye, you know, and, and then I posted what posted the, the tweet from Ian Moore, and my response is after that, basically, like I, I'm kind of in the camp of don't sing it, bring it. You know, I, I grew up with The Rock, you know, Dwayne Johnson, that's what he would say. And it's like, you can talk all you want, but at some point, you've got to step into the squared circle, Tom. And the, this rectangular 100, 100 yards by 52, 53 yards, and you've got to bring it. But I will give Ian more, uh, some more credit, because that wasn't the only tweet. So Ben Roebuck, who is committed to Michigan <laughs> from Ohio... Does, they did not get that Ohio State offer. And so Ben Roebuck is uh, quote tweeting Ian Moore's tweet. And he says, it always comes down to not having that offer. Michigan's got the better offensive line and better coaches. Seems like I wasn't missing out on much. Go blue. And then Ian Moore. Ian Moore from way downtown pulls a <laughs> screenshot of, uh, of a, an article from 2022, March 25th, 2022. St. Edward's Ben Roebuck, 2024's number four offensive lineman, says Ohio State offer this weekend would be a life highlight. That was the headline. <laughs> that is, Tony, to continue your uh, wrestling analogy, I believe he went off the top rope there. <laughs> that was that was a, a pipe bomb, as they say. That was a mic drop. Whichever analogy you want to throw in there. And so uh, I, I can't, um, you got to give him some credit for that one. You know, Luke Hamilton, another Michigan commit who did not uh, from Ohio, who did not get the Ohio State offer, uh, chiming in as well about grabbing some popcorn because this is comical. And uh, the the one here is that if you take the rankings out of the picture, what would our good buddy Ari Wasserman say about that, Tony? <laughs> so, like, yeah, sure, uh, but but if you take the rankings out, uh, then again, to be having this argument right now incredibly early way too soon is it entertaining sure do i feel a little bit uh, cringy about it of course 
Um, because I don't like talking before. And honestly, as an offensive lineman, when should you even talk about this rivalry in this manner? Your third year on campus? Because that's probably about when you're going to be playing, uh, maybe as a backup at, at times. So, like, this is, you know, they're talking about this, and they may not even have an impact in the rivalry until, like, 2027 or something like that. So, uh, it's a little premature, and, you know, you brought up the Kyle Kalis thing, and, and I was going to go to that as well because, uh, again, the, 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 the quote from him back in 2012, there will be blood on the field, and it won't be mine. <laughs> quote it, let them know. Kyle Kalis went 0-5 against Ohio State in his time at Michigan. Uh, former Ohio State commit, as you said, flipped, got you know threats from Ohio State fans, uh, and took that and pridefully ran with it. And, and you know this um, this slight, this chip on your shoulder that you're going to have didn't do him any good. You know, and, and I don't know that we'll see if it does it any 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 good for these uh, for the Michigan kids from Ohio who don't get that offer. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, at, at this point, I'm, I'm taking this kind of as entertainment. They may be taking it seriously. The, 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 I think maybe the truly interesting aspect of this is the fact that Luke Hamilton is, and uh, the, the Armstrong twins are teammates at St. Ed's. I think it's, I think it's Roebuck who's from St. Ed's, but it's, it, yeah, it's one of, one Roebuck, of, yeah. So, yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, these are guys who they're, they're camp. We have seen all of these guys at Ohio state's camp. Like they, a lot of times they're at the camp at the same time. So these are people you, you see, and you know, you can develop something of a friendship with, and you can develop something of it. You know, I'm sure a lot of you guys have each other's phone numbers and, uh, you know, are in text groups or whatever. And, you know, but you're also competing for a, you're also competing for a very coveted, uh, you know, scholarship offer from whatever, whatever program you're camping at that day or whatever. So, you know, it's a friendly thing, but it's a friendly competitive rivalry thing. And, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll see, uh, we'll, we'll all find out together how this plays out. Tony, I know this is normally a Buckeyes tomorrow morning thing, but, uh, the 2026 Ohio state Michigan game, 1,318 days away. So we're going to, we're going to see them settle this on the field, uh, then, or maybe 364 days or so after that, but definitely at some point this will get settled on the field. Probably. You know, <laughs> I can't wait. Um, I, I do think it'll be interesting to watch this uh, St. Ed's line. And, uh, you know, I don't know if Roebuck is like the right tackle and the Armstrong brothers are on the left side or whatever. I think what you need to do is separate them and then judge each game based on which side does better. And then you can like really get after each other. Like, man, the right side really sucked today or the left side really let everybody down. That way you can just really get into the minutia. And uh, hopefully uh, some Ohio State or Michigan fan will do that to really just get in there and you know, just you know, be a needle. Just be an, be an annoying needle. Uh, there's, there's other words you could use for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the official policy of the Buckeye Weekly Podcast is not that you should be taunting high school kids on social media. Just to be clear, just to be extremely clear in case you got the wrong impression from Tony there, do not taunt high school kids on social media. Thank you. No, I, I would say just at the coaches. <laughs> or the parents of the of the players if you don't want to attack the players the parents uh perfectly uh the official policy of the buckeye weekly podcast is you should never listen to anything tony says ever ever, ever. i'm just saying a manifesto uh <laughs> cutting out letters in a magazine and mailing it to the newspaper there's nothing wrong with it the, the whatever the 2023 version of the Zodiac Killer is, he is absolutely <laughs> tweeting at Cy high school recruits, 100. percent Tweeting in ciphers, totally acceptable. I don't know where we to should, go from here, Tom. Yeah, yeah, there, there's nowhere to go, so we're just going to plow forward. We're going to bravely plow forward. Commercial, yeah. yeah there you go. Uh, ad break. Okay, Tom. Uh, Tony Petiti is your new Big Ten commissioner. Uh, did you happen to see the Chicago Bears tweet from Kevin Warren's first day on the job? Uh, I did not, but I'm sure it was great. Uh, they made sure. So they, it, it's, a, it's a video of him arriving to the Bears facility for his first day on the job with a clock 
on the screen that says 547 a.m. And so you get to watch Kevin Warren come in super early, but that's probably just normal for him because he's a, you know, he's going to be working all day. And so he walks through the building and gets in to his office and sits in a chair and uh, like kind of doesn't even really necessarily acknowledge the camera. And then that's the end of the video. You got to remember, Tony, that's central time. So it's really 647. So they're kind (laughs) of cheating here. But it is so Kevin Warren to be like, look at me. It, it, It is the video version of all of my certificates and degrees on the back of the wall. That's exactly. Look how early I am getting here when it's like, that's pretty standard in the sports world and you know some other uh outlets as well you know like this is this is not something that should because you know he designed this he's like oh yes. what i want you to do is have some video person and i'll get in there at 547 a video person you'll need to be there by like you know 4 30 just to prepare and then uh when i get in just you know make sure that uh and, and now i'm thinking about this time they could have been like 9 30 at night and they just shot it the night before like the way you lie about the morning show at times tony it's called buckeyes tomorrow morning it's right there in the name it's not a lie it's right there in the name uh it yeah it, it's uh i think the most important part of that story was that the real hero is the guy with the camera who has to get there extra early and is actually uh actually the hero of the story uh i also would like to point out if they did not use hashtag grind set then i'm not sure the tweet actually counts <laughs> um no, I don't believe they did. So, uh, but but uh, Tony Petiti's first day will be May fifteenth, which uh, has me wondering who's running the Big Ten right now. Is this uh, the mice will t- mice will play kind of situation? Do you remember the uh, the bird that just sort of bobs up and down and just hits the Y key <laughs> on Homer's keyboard? That's basically it. And it's just be very careful what you put in. You know, should we yes. add Oregon to Washington? Why? <laughs> ah, crap. <laughs> Should we that's how, that's how Rutgers and Maryland got here. <laughs> Why is New Mexico State in the Big Ten? Eh, you got to blame the bobbing bird. I don't know, oh, man. man. That's. I knew he shouldn't have had it for an entire month, but that's that's what's going to happen. And um, so it, it is interesting to me that you know you go from Jim Delaney, who is like always like from sports and administrator, uh, old school, and and kind of that's what it was for the longest time. Brought them, brought college sports. Um, I'd say like clawing, but he was also doing some clawing. Like he's working hard to bring them forward while also working hard to keep them held back. But you get the TV, you get the Big Ten Network. Then you go to Kevin Warren, who is like, uh, I don't even, you know, uh, uh, a sports suit, basically like an, uh, a pro sports executive. Then you go to Tony Petiti, who is like a TV. Um, he was with the, the MLB and, and their, I think, what, streaming branch, or something like that. But it is now just like, we've got to go get a TV guy. You, there was talk, talk about maybe, do you get a politician? No, they went and got a, a TV guy. And it's like, that was the two, the, the two branches were, do we get a politician or do we get a TV guy? And it's like, was there ever thought of like, let's get a sports administrator? No, because this is no longer like, um, this is no longer a college sports type of thing. Right. I think you go back two, three years or even before Kevin Warren was hired. I guess that would have been about three years ago. And, there, you know, there was all the speculation that Jim Phillips, who was the AD at Northwestern at that point, was going to be the next Big Ten commissioner. And then he's now the commissioner of the ACC. And all the other ones that have uh, turned over since then have all been people with non-sports administration backgrounds. I mean, you know, Tony Petiti has worked at MLB and um, worked at very high levels in MLB. So, you know, he, he has worked in that area, but, you know, entertainment background, TV background, events background. In addition to MLB Network, he also was the one who came up with the Field of Dreams or was in charge of implementing the Field of Dreams game for MLB, where they go play at the uh, Field of Dreams in Iowa once a year. And, you know, I, it, I think it's very reflective of how that job has changed over the last few years. You don't need the guy who was the athletic director. The guy who is now running the NCAA was a former governor of Massachusetts. A lot of the guys running these these uh, the other commission the other conferences are former TV executives. George Klyavkov was a former TV executive, for example. So your mark too. Your mark too. Yeah, yeah. At at uh, Brett Yormark in the Big Twelve. And in case you're not up to speed on all the other college commissioners, and why would you be, frankly? So <laughs> uh, yeah, it you know it is sort of represent you know representative of the fact how that job has changed and. 
you know, right now, unquestionably, media rights are driving just about everything. And it's possible that continues for, you know, the next 10 years or whatever and 15 years. But what's interesting is, you know, I don't know that 10 years ago you would have necessarily said you need a TV guy in there because TV is going to be driving everything. And, it, you know, TV was driving some things at that point. Big Ten Network was created in 2007. But just how that's really changed uh, moving forward and just, you know, continued to grow over the years with. The, all the changes, not only with the growth of that and the import, the growth of the importance of, of sports programming and live sports programming in the media landscape, but also how the media landscape could be changing in the next five to 10 years with the growth of streaming and regional sports networks kind of collapsing in some ways. And, you know, what's going to happen with ESPN moving forward? And, you know, they're going to get spun off from Disney. And I mean, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. What's interesting is, you know, 10 years from now, is hiring a media guy still going to be the best, you know, is still that's still going to be the core function of the job or is there going to be something else that then you need to be a league commissioner? So uh, I'm, I'm fascinated to see how this plays out. But, you know, you look at you look at sort of the why behind what they did and it's like, OK, you bring in a guy who's had, you know, worked at high levels of a major professional sport, but also has that TV background that kind of tells you where they think the general sports college landscape is headed the next five to 10 years, I guess. Yeah. You wonder like in the next 10, in, the, in, in 10 years, will the hire be from the tech side of things, you know, or, you know, like the, 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 the social media tech aspect of it. And, and Larry Scott will be like, I told you guys, I was only, you know, 20 years too early. Poor Larry Scott, formerly of the PAC 12, who, um, as, as I'm looking at the Los Angeles Times article here, did Larry Scott kill the Pac-12? He's not poor Larry Scott. He made a lot of money in the Pac-12 and had a very nice office in the Pac-12. He's rich Larry Scott. He just didn't do a very good job. Yeah, and it's like one of these uh, what venture capitalists who come in and, and take a, a company over just to bankrupt it and then sell it off. That's uh, almost what he did with the Pac-12, and in fact, may uh, eventually be what, ha be what happens with the Pac-12. Um, but which leads me to my next question then is so like what is next for the Big Ten? What is Tony Petiti going to bring to the Big Ten? Where is the Big Ten going from here? And I think it's going to hold still for at least a, a couple of years, you know, unless Notre Dame wants to do something or unless the ACC finally collapses. Like I don't see anything happening with Washington and Oregon that what would change for the Big Ten to be like, okay, we want them now. When, in, you know, they, they've already said that or through reports, they're not necessarily interested in them right now. Now, I guess the operative word being right now, and maybe they would be in a year or two, but I don't know why unless this USC UCLA hits so well or doesn't hit well enough. They need to get some more Western uh, footprint out there. I don't know. What do you think is next? Yeah, I, I'm with you that I think you're probably looking at a year or two at least of, okay, calming of the waters. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is you have a new commissioner who's not necessarily going to be immediately be jumping in and trying to make major moves the first day he's in the office. Like you got to you got to figure out where the coffee maker is before you start in, you know, the copier before you start jumping in and trying to add teams before you shut down the Big Ten football. Yes, yes, before you before you uh, sell the Big Ten off for parts. Uh, <laughs> Rutgers to the junkyard. Who says no? Uh, it, it does, you know, you, you, I think you just have to look around the college sports landscape right now. The reason Washington and Oregon are not in the Big Ten right now is because the Big Ten did not want Washington and Oregon because they did not feel they were going to bring in enough revenue. So if Washington and Oregon were offered, I think it is probably fairly safe to say they would have jumped. So they were not offered because they, you know, the, the president's, I think didn't want to get too far out over their skis in terms of adding more people and, and maybe not bringing back the revenue. So, so the, you know, you're not probably doing that. You, you, the Big 12 and your old friend, Brett Yormark, who we just mentioned, has been constantly stirring the pot on, oh boy, you know, talking to the four corner schools out of the, out of the Pac-12 and oh boy, are they going to come soon to the, the Big 12? And you keep hearing talk and then the Big 12, the Pac-12 schools keep saying no, 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 no. Once the Big 12, or the Pac-12 gets its TV contract signed, which has been sort of just floating in limbo for seemingly months and months and months, if that gets signed later this summer, early this fall, whenever, then at that point, they're locked in with a grant of rights. 
And you're probably, you know, however long that contract is, you're probably more or less not, you know, seeing major changes during most of that contract. When you get closer to the end of the contract, okay, then you, when that contract is up, that's when you might see the next round of, uh, you know, shuffling in the, of the deck chairs. The other league that's maybe potentially at risk of getting picked off is the ACC and their grant of rights goes through 2036. So, and just, we've talked about this before, but just in case people don't know grant of rights, the short version is, when you sign a TV contract, you sign your TV rights over to the league, and then the league distributes the money back to you. So if you leave the league, well, the league still owns your TV rights. So if you, you know, if uh, North Carolina joined the Big Ten, that's great. The ACC would say, great, have a good time. Uh, we're going to have them mail the checks for your TV rights to us, and then uh, we will distribute them as we see fit. How much? I'm sure it's all going back to North Carolina in that scenario, right, Tony? Probably not. So, you know, then you get into the scenarios of, okay, what would it take to dissolve the ACC? Because at some point, if you, dis if, you know, there's 14 teams in the ACC right now, if nine of them leave and go somewhere else, then you have five teams, you don't have a conference anymore, and the whole thing, the whole deal just kind of goes away. If, you know, but, but in, you know, if Clemson and Florida State go to the SEC and North Carolina and Georgia Tech or Virginia go to the Big Ten, okay, the ACC still exists under that scenario, probably. If, it, if the ACC doesn't explode at that point, they're still probably under that grant of rights. And there are a lot of attorneys right now probably getting paid a lot of money to try and find, you know, the secret loophole to get out of the, uh, you know, the, to get out of that contract. But until someone finds that, you probably have stability there on the ACC front as well. Florida State was not very happy with the ACC recently. Their uh, athletic director gave a big presentation where... Uh, they, he talked about, you know, how far behind they are for all the other leagues. And, you know, so Florida state obviously is angling for either a bigger slice of the pie or to get out of the, uh, to get out of the pie altogether. But there's not, you know, right now they're locked into 2036. So the ACC doesn't really have a lot of incentive to give them a bigger slice of the pie or whatever. And so Florida state may just stay mad for 13 years or so. This is one of the back channels of. It, you know, Florida State going to Clemson, like, if we do this, are you in? And then you go to, like, whoever else, pit, like, are, are you, we're all going to have to jump out together or a, a, a certain number, a quorum, a seven or what, whatever, and you have to get these the votes and um and and then have to be steadfast and, and go forward and see what happens. And I, I don't know if we're going to get there. It, it, there are certainly teams that would be better off to leave, but you've got the the Wake Forest and the North Carolina States, whatever, holding everybody in. Like you know, don't leave us here in this raft to to get on the ocean liner, because you know you'll just leave everybody behind. So we'll see what happens there. Before we go, Tom, I just one thing that's been bothering me. Uh, so uh, this is this is a thing that's been bothering me, but then it re bothered me this morning when I heard it on the radio, Aaron. Um, Murray, former Georgia quarterback, said uh, on a, like ESPN radio or somewhere that Joe Milton, Tennessee quarterback, is the most gifted quarterback in college football. Is that a result of Tennessee's NIL program and he's gotten a lot of gifts? Or <laughs> no, it's, I still think that's Nico Iamaleva. Nico Iamaleva, yes, who is probably more gifted in that way than Joe Milton. But this is something I have a problem with because we saw Joe Milton at Michigan and he was bad. Now he's been at Tennessee now for two years, three, this is his third year. And I, I have this, like, I can't see him being good because we saw him be so bad. However, he's been away from Jim Harbaugh for a long time and he's now with a quarterback coach that can do something. But I don't see any uh, accuracy. That, that I, I don't see the accuracy. I just don't. I'm not buying that he is going to be this the, the second coming, or he's going to be this the guy that carries Tennessee forward this year. Tony, I'm going to answer your question with a well, it wasn't really a question, but I'm going to answer your question with a question. Uh, did you see Will Levis's odds to be the number two overall <laughs> pick in the draft? In fact, I've I've seen I've seen plenty of odds. Yes. Uh huh. Um, so sometimes people fall in love with quarterbacks with like one big physical trait and, um, you know, maybe overlook that for 
you know, overlook other pieces of the puzzle in terms of playing quarterback? Uh, have you seen that happen maybe at some time in the past? Could you cite any recent examples, for example? <laughs> you know, I actually grabbed the uh, the last 15 years, the quarterbacks who were drafted in the top 10 in the first round. If, if I tell you the NFL is batting uh, around 500, and, it, and, I, and I think it's under 500, somebody else may say over 500, uh, I mean, that's... That's the situation where, yeah, there there is as likely to hit as not hit on top ten picks, and it's because they fall in love, like you say, with you know one particular thing, like Jake Locker. Oh, he's fast; he can run. Blaine Gabbert. Well, I don't know what they fell in love with there, but you know stuff like that. Um, and Joe Milton probably has you know he, if you say he has the biggest arm in the nation, that's fine. But accuracy is also a gift. You, you got to look, Tony, at, at some of those big arm quarterbacks in the past. Could he be the next Jamarcus Russell and go number one overall? Yes, absolutely, he could. How'd that how'd that work out? I forget. Well, uh, he went number one, as you mm-hmm. said. Mm-hmm. I lost track after that, mm-hmm. but I'm going to assume everything worked out and uh, led the Raiders to many Super Bowls. Mm-hmm. Probably, yeah. That's I think that's exactly what happened. We're talking about Kenny Stabler, right? I forget which. <laughs> I forget Jim which. Plunkett. Yes, yes. Uh, so I, I think uh, anything else, Tom, before we go, I just had to get that off my chest. That's that's good. Yeah, I, it, I think it turns out that evaluating quarterbacks is kind of hard. But also sometimes when you watch them play in college, it's like mm, there's some very obvious flaws in this in this guy's game. And I have not batted a thousand on my uh, college quarterback evaluations either. I did not think Josh Allen was going to be any good in the pros and he's worked out fine. But for every Josh Allen, oh, boy, there's a Zach Wilson. And it's like, I'm sorry, you're. You, you're picking him why? Uh, you know, there there are a bunch of things that work out in terms of being predictive of will this be a good pick or not? Um, you know, college completion percentage, number of snaps played in college, whether the Jets are picking him. I mean, there's a lot of factors you got to consider there when you're evaluating a quarterback pick. And, uh, you know, so as I said, it's, it's complicated. And speaking of quarterbacks, I'll just say this. RIP to the Arch Manning hype. Um, Quinn Ewers is named the starter. Unfortunate uh, that we won't have to hear um, about Arch Manning uh, anymore, at least for a year or so. So, Tony, would you say he's your arch nemesis? No, I've never met him. I assume he's a great <laughs> kid. Uh, I mean, he's Cooper's kid. Cooper's the best of the Mannings. That's that's facts only. They're all they're all fantastic, though. They're all fantastic. Uh, much better, you know. The, it used to be the four CAs, but as we know, it's the Mannings on top now qbman.com love it <laughs> all right let's go i want to thank you all for tuning in as always please join uh buckeyehuddle.com become a member say hello to us there on the message board we are there chatting 23 hours a day so uh it's up from 20 hours uh this is the this is the this is the the season where you know we've wrapped up spring so we got to be on there talking about it more and more and more uh so find us there also you can find us at youtube.com uh, slash buckeye huddle and uh, watch all of our videos, hit the bell to be notified when we go live. Hit the thumbs up on this one, perhaps, if you would like. Uh, we do appreciate that. So thank you all for joining us, and we will talk to you guys later.